<clears throat> Hello and welcome back to the Nextflow and NFCore online community training event. My name is Chris and I'm a developer advocate at Secura Labs and I'll be the one taking you through the training material again today. We'll first start off with a recap of what we did in session one and session two. We will talk about what we'll do today as a part of session three and then look forward to what we're doing tomorrow as a part of session four. In session one, we started with a welcome and an introduction to the Nextflow ecosystem. We started to get to know the Nextflow language by examining the hello.nf script. And then we started to expand on this by developing our own proof of concept RNA-seq pipeline. In session two, we were introduced to NF Core and we looked at NF Core for both users and developers and looked at some of the documentation and tooling that's available. We finished off the session by looking at modules and some workflows and how these can be used and shared between different pipelines. Today, as a part of session three, we will be expanding on some of the concepts that you've been introduced to as a part of session one. So how you can manage your dependencies and containers, channels, processes, and operators. You have an introduction to the Groovy language, um, and we'll expand on modularization of uh, modules. In session four, we'll continue to expand on some of the concepts you've been introduced to. So the configuration of pipelines, different deployment scenarios, cache and resume, some ways you can troubleshoot, and we'll finish off by getting you started with Nextflow Tower. If you have any questions during this event, please direct them all to the dedicated Slack channels. We have a number of community volunteers who will be there to help you during the event. Okay, so let's get started. What I would like everyone to do is head back to the training material that we use as part of session one at this link shown on the screen. Okay, so here I am back on the Nextflow training website. Um, if you're still looking for this again, this is training.nextflow.io. So if you type that into your browser, you should be able to find this site. For anyone that was using Gitpod, I'd like you to click on this button here that says Gitpod open in Gitpod. And this will open up a new Gitpod environment that we can use as a part of this training. If you're using um, your local system, uh, please just move back to the NF, um, NF core material, excuse me, Nextflow material that um, you had open previously. So the Git repository that you cloned. What you're seeing here um, on my screen is a list of the running workspaces. So Gitpod actually saves the environments that we had used previously. Um, in this case, though, I would like everyone to just create a new workspace. Um, I have already done this, um, which is why we have a couple of these listed here already, um, but mine is already open here. It's quite nice to just open a brand new environment. Um, this is because any changes that you might have made um, in previous environments won't be included here. This is brand new. This is that base image that we started off from last time. Um, so like I said, if there's anything that's, that's happened in the background or if you've changed anything um, that you weren't supposed to, um, it's totally okay. This is a new environment um, and we're all going to start off from square one again. But because we are starting from square one, um, we also need to add some things back into this environment that we did in session one um, that won't be here now in session two. And the first thing is adding a version of Nextflow. Um, so we can do this here. Um, so you might remember that as a part of the environmental setup, we exported the version of Nexo that we want to use. Um, I'm just going to go back to this environment and do this again. Um, so I've just added in that version. And then we can do something like Nextflow minus V for Nextflow version, just to check that that is uh, being installed um, correctly. Cool. That looks like it's worked properly. Um, so you can see down the bottom there that is 22.4.5. What I will also do is you might remember that as a part of session one, we added an extra line to our config here which is docker enabled equals uh, true. Just going to save that as well. So this is something we did just so that um, whenever we're executing a script from this folder, um, it would look at this, the next flow would look at this next flow config file um, and it would see that you want docker to be enabled every time. Um, so that just stops us from having to use with docker um, whenever we execute a command. Okay, um, so that's everything you need to do in a new environment. You get it back to a place um, that it was at the end of session one. What we'll do now is jump back to the training material. Um, we'll go down here to managing dependencies and containers. Um, this bit at the top here is quite a nice explanation of um, why you should use um, something to manage your dependency and containers. Um, I think it's, it's quite a, a nice summary. 
Um, so computational workflows are really composed of single scripts and tools. And we saw this as a part of the introduction in session one. Um, there's lots of different tools and scripts included in that, um, that DAG diagram that we showed you. Um, as such, installing and maintaining such dependencies is challenging um, and it's quite time consuming as well and a massive source of e-reproducibility e in science. Um, so to overcome this, you can use things like containers um, and container management software uh, to manage your tools and libraries uh, for your data analysis applications uh, because all of the tools uh, can be encapsulated in one or more self-contained, ready to run, immutable Linux containers, uh, which can be easily deployed uh, using things like Nextflow. Okay, um, so that's all the introduction I want to do. Um, we're just going to jump straight into some coding. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is look at using Docker. Um, so Docker is a management tool uh, built to uh, to build, run, and share container images. Um, and there's lots of extra information, extra information um, about this online. Um, what I wanted to do here is just show you how you can sort of work through some of these ideas of, of running, pulling um, containers and running them in interactive modes, um, sort of build up to creating our own uh, container and using it to run one of the scripts that we've already uh, used as a part of session one. So going back here to uh, the Git pod environment, what we can do first is type in Docker, um, see that Docker is installed and there's a bunch of information on um, different options and commands that we can use. What we can do is Docker run hello world. So this is um, just an example of actually running a um, a container from this online library, um, which is, contains Hello World. Um, I tried to find it locally, it couldn't. It's pulled it from uh, library Hello World. Um, here's the pull complete with the digest and the status and just the output of Hello World. Um, so we know Docker is installed. We know that it can talk to the internet and it can pull down um, these containers from, from public libraries. Um, and that's a really great place to start. What we can also do um, is sort of use Docker to um, pull down like a base image of a, um, a Linux system, which we can then use to develop on top of to add in all the tools and software that we need. Um, so in this example, um, and in the training material, um, under 4.1.2, under pull a container, um, we have this line of code here, which is Docker pull uh, Debian, which is a version of Linux, um, stretch slim. So it's just a slim down version of it. Um, so here it's just pulling it. So bringing it down and loading it into our system. Uh, we're making it available to us locally. Um, and this is telling us what it's doing. It's pulling it. It's complete. Um, here's some, some checks that it's done to make sure that everything is working um, as well as where it's stored. So if you were to run something like Docker images, um, you can see that we now have this downloaded um, or being pulled to our system. So we have repository Debian. It has a tag, um, an image ID, um, and the size here, which will be quite useful to track. We also see Hello World, which is what we've just pulled. Um, or was pulled automatically when we ran it um, just previously. You see that's very, very small, um, as well as this RNA-seq um, NF uh, image, which we've used um, previously here as a part of uh, the Nextflow config, for example. Okay, so um, we now have this image. Um, we can use Docker images to actually view what images we have available to us uh, locally. Uh, this is all still in our system. What I can show you next is how you can actually run these, these containers in an interactive mode. So before I do that, what we can do is just show that here we are sitting in our in our repository, um, NF training folder, and these are all the scripts and things that are available to us. We can run docker minus IT, so that means it's an interactive mode, and then specify the uh, repository um, image that we're using, and we're just going to use it with bash. And what it has done is it's actually allowed us to go into this container. So we're now operating inside this Docker container in an interactive way. So if you do things um, like you list the contents, you see that um, we're in a completely different sort of file directory. Um, this is completely separate to where we were. So all the files that we had in our Gitpod environment don't exist in here. This is a completely different operating system. Um, if you want to exit this, you just type in exit and it'll get you out of um, that container. Okay, so um, there's a very quick example of that, that you can actually um, enter these containers in an interactive way. Um, what I want to do next is actually build my own container. So currently, we just all we've done is use containers that are available online. I want to create my own. So to do that, I'm going to use um, code Docker file, and this will create a Docker file at the top here for me. 
Um, this is the same as something like Vim or Nano. Um, I've just used code to automatically open this up in my browser. What I'm going to do next is actually copy out everything inside um, this, this code block here um, and put it into my Docker file. So what this is, is just saying from Debian stretch slim. So this is the base image that we're using and we're gonna build on top of this in this container. So uh, we have some information here. So this could be like my name, for example, it doesn't really matter for now, but um, you can add some, some labels. Um, here we are installing um, an additional piece of software. In this case, it is called Calsay, um, which is just a fun tool that you can use to um, create a cow that creates, uh, that says something on your screen. Um, and down here, we're just sort of exporting making sure this is available um, on our path. So I'm just going to save that and make sure you do save that. You'll see it's popped up over here in my Explorer. Um, and what we can do now is build the image. So this will be down in 4.1.5. We have this build command. Um, so we can use Docker build um, using minus T to give it a name, uh, my image. And don't forget this little dot here because that just means that it's happening in the current directory. So as you can see here, we've got steps one through five, um, step a step has been created for every line um, in this Docker file. Um, and as you can see here, it's just sort of downloading and including everything it needs to um, and putting it inside this container. So you can see um, successfully built and it's been successfully tagged with my image latest. So now if we were to do uh, the Docker images, which oh, Docker images, um, you can see that this new my image has been created. Um, it's been given the tag latest. It was created 20 seconds ago and it's 130 megabytes. Okay, um, so that has now been created. Um, and we can now use this image. So we can run this image. Um, we could just run it directly from our um, current uh, from current directory using CalSay. So CalSay is a function. And we can do hello, next flow. And there we go. So what's happening here is we're using Docker to run the image. The image is getting run with the CalSay function and CalSay is saying hello.nextflow. Um, we can see that CalSay isn't actually installed. Hello, nextflow. Um, this isn't actually installed on my system. That just fails. So CalSay only exists within this container image. And we have to use that container um, for it to actually work. Um, so that's really nice. Um, but as you be aware, um, Calsay isn't overly useful for uh, a biophatic pipeline. But what we can do is we can rebuild this image with um, a tool that might be more, more use. So under 4.1.6, um, so over here, we can add a software package to the image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this, and I am going to add this into my Docker file. So this will be on line 10 to 12. Um, if your line is slightly different, it doesn't matter too much. Um, so all this is doing is just saying basically curl uh, this tool and install it onto this into this image into this container. Um, so what we can do is I'm just going to save that again. Then we can do uh, Docker build uh, minus t image dot again, and this was rebuild this image. What you can see here is we've still got steps one through five, uh, but we now have an extra step, so step six of six which is running um, this code, this new code that we've introduced up here um, to download and install salmon within this image. Um, so now we can do Docker run. Um, we can do my image salmon. So because salmon is available, we use salmon and scripts one through seven. Um, yes, uh, part of session one. And we can just check the version. And we see salmon 1.5.2. So that's a version of salmon that was installed. Um, you can see that included here as well. And also up here, that is 1.5.2, um, the version that was installed. Um, as well as this, we could just run this in interactive mode. So we can actually enter this container and um, use um, salmon within it. So we could do docker run minus it uh, my image and bash at the end there. Um, so again, we've entered this. This is a different file system. You see that we now have this salmon um, included here. Um, and we could just do salmon, say how M O N. A few typos there. Um, we can see that we get the image. Um, we get the version of salmon printed again, which is cool. So um, images are a way that you can basically 
um, include one or more pieces of software on top of a, a, a Linux a Linux base image, um, and actually have all that packaged together, um, which is really cool. So that is nice. That is um, cool. What we will do next is I will just show you um, a little bit about fist file system mounts. So if you were to run this image, uh, this line of code, uh, this bit of code here, um, on your system, you'll see that it actually fails. Um, and you'll see that this is because this, this transcriptome file provided by the transcriptome um, does not appear to exist. So as already alluded to um, and mentioned a couple of times, the file system that exists within the container is separate to the file system that um, I'm currently sitting in as part of this GitPod environment. So when we're like listing the files that are available, um, the, the Docker container is separate to what we're actually working in right now. And because of that, we need to include, um, we need to include uh, basically the volume or, or give Docker a way to talk to the current file system. Um, so there are a couple of different ways sort of described here. Uh, the first is that you can just sort of specify the exact file that you want to um, include. So we can just copy this line of code here. And we can just paste that again there. And what you'll see is a big long output that is saying that this has worked and that this is um, this file was available. This is really because um, what we're doing here is we're just mounting, um, oops, um, we're mounting um, the current working directory um, and then the relative path to this file. Um, and we're providing that again to the container uh, when it is being run. That is if you're doing one file, uh, one file, excuse me. Um, alternatively, you could sort of mount um, the parent directly, the parent directory um, as an identical one in the container, um, doing um, this PWD um, colon PWD. Um, so that's just sort of saying this working parent directory to the to the current directory, re-specifying the parent directory within the container, um, and that works as well. So that's just an easier way in that you can sort of include everything that is um, included locally um, to the container as well. Um, you can also set a folder um, doing this. Um, so you can set, um, in this case, it's called data, and you can specify it again doing this. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to dig into this more detail and show you how things break and work together. Um, but I just want to highlight that you do need to actually mount um, the data that you want to use as part of your container because it is a different um, file system. There's a little bit extra here about how you can upload your container um, to Docker Hub. So if you have a Docker account, you can um, create these for free and you can log in, um, provide a few details and actually share this so that others could also use this um, use your images as well, use your containers as well. Okay, um, so what we're actually working up to here was was running um, the image that we've created, so our image that contains salmon um, with one of our scripts. So you might remember script two from session one. Um, script two is quite a quite a short script. It only really has the one process, which is indexing um, the transcriptome.fa file. So this is the file up here that we've included as a parameter um, we specified it in here, and it's just running salmon index on it. Um, as you can see down the bottom, it works quite nicely um, by specifying um, our new image. One thing I do want to point out here is that we're using with Docker and the my image file, or the my image container. Um, we're doing this in the command line rather than in the config because we already have um, this next file RNA seq um, nf container here. Um, so by doing this in the command line, we're effectively overriding. Um, what's happening here in the config, um, as you might remember again from session two, where we talked about the different places that you can configure a pipeline. Okay, so um, that's really Docker. What we will do is we're going to skip Singularity because it's not installed on the system and jump down here to the Conda, Bioconda um, packages. So Conda is another popular package um, environment manager. Um, all of your NextFlow pipelines will, will most likely have um, Conda environments that you can also use um, when uh, you are executing the pipeline. So you could say with uh, use Docker, Conda, Singularity. Um, Conda is another way to use these tools, um, but it's slightly less reproducible because um, you're not sort of building on top of these Linux images. So um, you can have different things happening and versions changing in the background. Um, the first thing we need to do is actually just um, run this code here, which is Conda init and bash. Um, so this is just because um, 
we need to add basically a line of code um, for shell interactions. Um, and this wasn't done previously. So all we need to do is just do conda init and bash. And it's just modified our um, git pod bash rc file. Um, and then we just need to um, run bash again just to actually apply this. Um, okay, so again, we'll work through this quite quickly. And I do apologize about that. But um, what I want to show you is we have this environment.yaml um, file. Um, so this is sitting in here. Um, you can open this as well in your GitPod environment. Um, as you can see, it's got a name, some channels, and dependencies. So these are all the tools that we used um, in our script 7 um, pipeline, uh, script 7 pipeline that we developed as a part of session 1. Um, and what we are going to do is we're going to create an environment um, using conda, so conda environment create using the file env.yaml. So what, what this will do is create um, a conda environment list. Um, so at the moment you can see all we've got there is base. Uh, we're going to create another one with these, uh, with the file environment or env.yaml, um, which will contain, contain all of these dependencies. This will take a little uh, moment to run. Um, so what I will do, um, just to keep things moving, is just sort of point out um, the next couple of little bits of code that we're about to look at, um, so that when we actually come to doing this in the command line um, here, that will move through it quite quickly. So um, as already shown, you can use this conda um, env.list, and this will list all the different conda environments that are um, available locally on your system. Um, so originally we had base. You can tell that this is one that was active by having this little asterisk here. We're creating NF tutorial which is the name that we have given this environment here. Um, and this will be the location that is created. Uh, we can run this um, after the environment is created to look at this. We will also see um, that this is inactivated. So we can run conda activate and then look at the conda environment list again. We'll see that this little asterisk has moved down here, meaning that this is the one um, that has been activated. And then we can actually use um, this next flow run script seven um, with conda so this is much like with docker but we can use with conda instead and then this will be the path to the um, environment that we've created here so what this is doing um, just kind of recap and bring it back to um, kind of the bigger picture here is that you can use um, effectively a recipe to create an environment and then you can execute your pipeline with that environment using nextflow um, with this with conda flag so this is still taking a wee bit of time to run. Um, so what I'll do is I'm actually just going to pause um, the video. And once it's finished, I will come back and um, show you the rest. OK, again, my apologies about that. Uh, just keep things moving. I decided to pause it there for a second. What you can see on my screen um, is that we've run this, run this command, conda environment create. I'm using the XAML file. And then down the bottom, um, a couple of warnings there, but nothing to worry about. Um, but we've now created this environment uh, that we can look at using conda environment list. And we can see that we now have this um, NF tutorial, um, which is the environment that we've used um, this recipe for. And we can activate it here um, just by using something like conda, conda activate. Cool. So that's, um, that's how you can create an environment using conda. Um, but probably what you're wondering is how can you use this in Nextflow? Um, this can be done quite simply and easily by using something like Nextflow Run, um, your script name, and then just changing from with Docker or whatever you're using to manage um, your software to with Conda, um, and then just specifying the path to uh, this, this environment that's being created. Um, if you're doing this locally, it might be a little bit different, um, but if you're just using Gitpod like me, um, you should be able to type that in and it should work pretty quickly. Um, and as you can see here, it started running um, and everything seems to be working quite nicely. Um, so one other thing that you can do um, is you can create a kind of like environment using MicroMumba. Um, again, you can use um, a recipe like this, um, and then you just modify your Docker container a little bit um, so that you actually just build this within the container using, um, using MicroMumba, um, slightly different base image there as well. Unfortunately, that's quite time consuming as well, um, and we don't have time for it today. Um, but if this is something that does interest you, uh, there's some really nice documentation here about it. 
One other thing I can show you is that you can also pull um, containers directly from an online community initiative such as BioContainers. So for example, um, most tools, um, if not all tools that you'll probably come into contact as a biocondition, um, a lot of them exist um, already on biocontainers and you can pull directly from biocontainers, the repository, um, instead of having to create your own image. So just to show this, um, you can just pull. So this is Docker pull, much like we did Docker um, pull of the Debian um, stretch slim image. This is just downloading. Um, pulling straight from the repository. Um, and then down here, there's quite a nice exercise where you can actually um, use this image that we've just pulled um, to execute the script to again. Um, in this case, using salmon. Um, but up here, this is this is fast QC, so it's a little bit different. Um, but down here, you can um, actually do this exercise, which is which is quite a nice one. Um, down here, there's a little bit more of a complicated um, Exercise where you can actually specify the container as a part of your process. So this is something that we do a part of NF Core. So you can specify a container as a part of um, for every process, for every module. Um, it can have a separate container so that everything is kind of like a substitutable unit um, and everything kind of moves around together. So you don't have to worry about creating one big one big container for all of your software. You just have lots of small ones, um, which can be quite nice. Um, Okay, um, so I think that's finished downloading. And what we can do is just Docker um, images. Um, you can see that now exists down there as well. So it's pulled from the BioContainers FastQC repository with a version. Um, and of course, we know it was made in the size. Um, there's probably much more recent versions of this considering it was created four years ago. Okay, um, so we will move on to the next bit of the training material, which is um, channels, processes, and operators. Okay, so for the next 60 minutes or so, we will go back and talk about um, channels, processes, and operators in more detail. These are all things that I've mentioned and given a one or two examples of um, as we're developing other scripts, other workflows as a part of this training. Um, but now is really the opportunity that we're going to go back um, and dig into these in more details. Um, and hopefully, I'll give you some more explanations and examples that'll help you understand of how these things work and what they mean. So, starting with channels, um, as a reminder, channels are key data structures um, that allow for um, reactive functional orientated computer, excuse me, computational workflows based on the data flow programming paradigm. Um, so what that essentially means is that they're used to pass data from um, one task to another. Um, so here we just have task alpha and beta and that's channel uh, is passing files z, y, and x uh, between them. Something we haven't spoken about is that there are different types of channels. Um, the first being queues and the second being values. Queue channels are asynchronous unidirectional uh, FIFO queues that connect two processes or operators. Asynchronous means that they are uh, non-blocking. Unidirectional means that they flow from a producer to a consumer. And FIFO means that the data is guaranteed to be delivered in the same order as it was produced. So first in, first out. A queue channel is implicitly created by process output definitions or using a channel factory such as channel of um, and channel from path. So I guess by default, you probably expect a lot of your channels um, to be queue channels. Um, consequently, if you were to do something like this um, in a simplest form, um, I'm going to be using snippet.nf, bring paste it in there and save it, and then we can just um, run this. So this is just going to be next flow uh, run snippet.nf. Um, again, this is just the name of the the file um, that excuse me next flow is executing. Um, you can see the output here is one, two, and three. The second type of channel um, is values. So a value channel is also known as a single channel. And by definition, it has to be a single value and it can be read unlimited times. So this is quite important that it can be consumed um, without limit. A value channel is created using the value factory method or by operators returning a single value. So first, last, um, collect, count, min, max, reduce, and sum. Um, so the examples of that, um, and the main thing to remember is that it's, it's really just a single value. Um, you will never be able to have a value channel of more than one value. Um, so um, to really show you how this works and how this relates to channel queues, um, we will play around with this script here. So I'm just going to paste this on top of the snippet.nf. Um, you're very welcome to do the same. 
So if we were to run this, we have channel of one, two, and three, and channel of one, um, making up channel one and channel two. Um, so sorry, quite a few numbers there. But um, we have this process block, um, which is essentially taking both of these channels, so channel um, one and channel two, giving a standard output. And inside the script block, we are getting we are adding these two together. Um, so you're expecting these numbers to be added together. Um, down here in the workflow block, we just have the process sum uh, with the two channels, and we're viewing um, those uh, the up the resulting um, output. So again, um, we're just going to run this. And what you might remember, um, what I said earlier, is that Q channels can only be, you know, the, the parts of a Q channel, the elements can only be consumed once. So in this case, we have channel one, two, and three, and only one element, so one in this channel two. Because we have more in channel one than channel two, it means that only the, the addition, the sum, will be calculated for when there are two channels to be combined. Um, so that's why we only have two, because this one is getting added to this one, um, and then it has to stop because there's nothing for this two and three to be added to. Um, so to show this in a slightly different way, I'm just going to add in um, one extra number, then we execute that again. And what we'll hopefully see is two and four, because the one is getting added with the one, and the two is getting added with the two, because the, the order of these are maintained. Um, again, so we can see two and four. Um, if you had added three, um, you could do that. If you had added four, um, you know, this will work the same way. One plus one, two plus two, three plus three, and this four is going to be left out because it doesn't have a pair. Yep, so I was only executed three times um, because we only had the three elements to be passed through. Okay, so that's fine. Um, when it's a channel, a channel will only be um, used if there's, in this case, um, another channel for it to be paired with um, for this function. But what happens if we have a value channel? So we can get rid of these numbers and change this from channel of to channel value. So remembering value channels can only contain one element. And as a part of that, it can be consumed multiple times. So we can run this again. And you can see here, two, three, and four. So we're having one being added to the one, one being added to the two, and one being added to the three, uh, producing these three um, outputs here. So you might be wondering um, how this how this works. Essentially, what's happening is under the hood. Um, so sort of happening behind the scenes with Nextflow, um, Q channels contain um, what's known as a poison pill. So once it's consumed, um, this poison pill is hit and the, it stops. This is different to a value channel, which doesn't have this. So what you can do here is actually um, run these little bits of code, um, but run them with um, this DSL1 flag. So DSL1 is, a, is an older version of Nextflow, uh, but it also has this capability of actually printing this to screen, um, something we can't do very easily with DSL2. Um, so you can you can run this again just with channel of one um, and then channel.value one and print these lines. And you'll be able to see that you do get these differences here. Um, but it's more just for those that are interested. There's this kind of poison pill happening um, under the hood, which is why the processes stop. Okay, um, here's just another example. Um, we've actually used the first operator. Um, like I said, you can use these operators to uh, basically produce a single value, and those single values are thought of as value channels rather than Q channels. Um, so we're doing this here. Um, actually, I think it's probably nicer just to show this. Um, so it's channel two dot first up here. It is a channel of, so it should be a Q channel. Um, but by running it like this, um, what you'll see is that this Q channel has been turned into a value channel because of this operator, um, meaning that um, it can be used multiple times. Great. Um, so that's that's kind of like the differences between Q channels and value channels. Um, what we can do now is just work through this list of channel factories. So there are lots of different types of channel factories. Um, of course, some of these produce queues. Um, when it's the the, uh, the value channel, for example, it does produce um, the value type of channel. Um, so what we have here um, is channel one, channel two, and channel three, 
probably what's most interesting about this is that you'll notice here um, that this is actually a list. So you can include a list as a single value. So that if you were to view this, I'm just going to append um, view on the end there. Uh, we're going to run this. Um, you'll see that this, this is printed as one, but if we were to add another element, so another thing outside of this list, um, you'll see that this will fail because it'll be an invalid uh, data type, I assume. Yeah, um, invalid method invocation value. So um, not a data type, as a, um, it's, it's because of the invalid method. Um, you know, you could always just try and include that as a part of your list, um, depending on what you're trying to do. There we go. Um, and they'll be fine again. Um, so we've talked about values. We've talked about um, using of, so channel.of. Um, we've done this in the previous script. Um, one thing different here is that it just added this value um, at the start here. And what that'll do is just uh, print some text at the start of your outputs. So here, uh, one, three, five, and seven. Each of those is getting used as an item, um, sort of generated dynamically because of this dollar sign. Um, and you can see that's getting printed out to the screen there. Um, okay, so um, you can also use um, things like ranges to sort of generate um, slightly more interesting um, lists. Uh, not excuse me, your lists, um, channels. Uh, so here, for example, we've got channel of 1 to 23, um, X and Y. And you can sort of execute that again, and we'll see that it becomes a big long list. Rather than having to specify every number individually, um, it can generate for you, those for you. There's also channel from list. Um, and this is quite a nice way that, say, you had a list of things um, that you wanted to include. Hello world, again. Um, so we can take this from a list. We know it's a list because it's got the square brackets and we can view it. Um, you can run that again, and this should give us um, the channel output, which is each of these as separate, uh, separate lines. Yep, hello world again. Um, we've already used hello path quite a lot, so this is how we um, specify a path, um, or in this case, a file. Um, here, for example, we can do um, something like this. So we can include that um, in a pipeline or in this, this little bit of code here. So the channel from path data meta.csv. So we know that data meta.csv, there's a couple in there. Um, it's picked up both of those because we've got this glob um, wildcard in there. So there's a little bit more information here about the different types of um, ways that you can find files um, using from path. Um, these are all quite dynamic and can be used in really um, useful ways if you are trying to specify um, files and subfiles in different folders. Okay, um, we already looked at using from file pairs, so this is the same as what we were doing um, in session one when we were trying to when we were pulling in. Um, excuse me, we're pulling in multiple files um, using this this one two pattern. So the paired files. Um, We've already looked at this in some detail during our development of our RNA-seq pipeline. Yep, so we've still got the gut, liver, and lung um, with the paired um, FASTQ files that is picked up um, using this pattern. Um, so we've also got from SRA, so this can pull straight from um, the SRA repository online. Um, I don't have this set up today, and just because of the time, it does um, take a little bit longer to set up, so I will move past that for now. Um, but I, what I do want to show you is that you can also um, bring in um, sort of data um, from text files, for example. Um, so here, for example, we can have channel from path, which is a text file, and then we can use the split text, and this will split the text up into um, sort of usable chunks. Um, so here, for example, we can go back to this path. Let's copy that. 
So we've got from path, data, meta, um, random text. So data, meta, random text. And we can see that here. We've got seven lines um, with some text in there. What we can then do is look at the output um, of this. So we can look at the outputs of this channel. And we can see here it's been split into multiple lines. This can become more dynamic and you can sort of keep um, developing this in different ways. Um, here, for example, we're going to split the text by 10 and change it to uppercase. Um, so you can imagine that if you did have like a sample sheet, uh, you could bring that in and potentially split it up um, and sort of use different parts of that file in different ways, depending on how that, that file was originally structured. So again, we're going to bring in this random text. Um, we're going to split it up into chunks of 10, um, or split it up into 10 chunks, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10 chunks, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, I guess it's all been split, I'm not sure why they did that actually. By 10 is probably a good example to actually go back and read into the documentation, um, but for now we'll keep moving um, through this. Oh, here we go. Split files into chunks of 10 lines and transform them into capital letters. I guess because it doesn't have 10 lines, it hasn't. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, R. Oh, that'll be the... <laughs> yeah, so that's probably a bad example, but um, if we had more lines of code there, it would split it into um, slightly better chunks. Um, you could also do something like this. So this is just going to add a count to the start of every line. Um, so count starts at zero, and as you're iterating through, um, you're adding um, onto that count. So here, for example, we can run that again, and that'll produce um, some counts at the start of those lines. Yep, so we got zero through six. Um, so it is zero, well, it started at zero here. So um, that was the first one, then it became higher with every iteration. So um, this is just a very simple example with a text file, um, but you can also use um, CSV files here, for example, we've got some, some patient data um, which has been brought in and then split and then um, sort of manipulated using um, row or into different rows and we've been indexed. Um, so different parts of that file will be um, shown. So for example, we can go and dig into this detail. So we've got patient one, uh, so we've got patient ID, um, Jira ID, S3 directory, number of samples, uh, manual failed regions. Um, all of this is um, separated by commas, and NextFlow will automatically pick this up. But what we want to do is actually just only look at certain columns. Um, so we've run that again. We've used the index to actually just pull out the patient ID and the number of samples. Um, so that's just those two columns there again, just um, with the with the uh, excuse me commas as separators. Um, there are other examples here, so you can do different things to specify different columns or add different column headers um, as you go. Um, there's some more information here about using um, tabs as separators, um, but just because of time we won't dig into that. Similarly, um, what I can show you here is that there are more complex file formats and there are ways that you can um, import functionality to um, handle this for you. Um, so these are all quite nice examples. Um, but that's all we really have time for for channels. Um, just to recap, um, there are the two main types, which are queues and channels, uh, queues and values. Um, and the biggest difference is that the queues um, are asynchronous, uh, unidirectional, and FIFO, whether um, that these value channels are one value can be used multiple times, um, which is in contrast to the queue channels, which each, each element can only be used once. Okay. Yes, so processes. In NextFlow, a process is the basic computing primitive used to execute um, the sort of functions um, that we're trying to include as a part of our pipeline. So they could be custom scripts or tools. As already sort of noted and shown, the processes start with the keyword uh, process, followed by the process name, and finally the process body uh, delimited by curly brackets. By convention, the process name is commonly uh, written in uppercase letters. It can be seen here with this process, say hello. Um, and this is really just for sort of making it easy to identify processes uh, as part of your larger pipeline. A basic process only has to have a script um, as a definition block. Um, it might look something like this, but in reality, they can be much more complicated 
and include up to five definition blocks, which are directives, inputs, outputs, um, when statements, and the script. Down here, we kind of have an outline of how this is all sort of shaped. Um, by convention, you'll, you'll probably have the directives at the top, input, outputs, um, your when statements, and the shell script. Um, I think largely you do need to keep to this sort of format. Um, if you play around with it too much, you might find that things start to fail. Looking at a real world example, uh, we can look at the salmon um, index module. So this is an unicorn module, um, and you can sort of see the same format again. We have a process um, which is named salmon index. We have some directives at the top. We have our input, our output, um, a when statement, and a script with a few definitions, um, and our script wrapped up in here with these um, double quote marks. So uh, let's start off by examining the script block and, and how this works. So here uh, we have this example, which is process example. Uh, we have the script block um, with the double quotes, and we have a series of different lines. So you can sort of include different lines as part of your script block. It doesn't have to be one big long line. Um, and down here in the workflow, we're executing this. We can show this uh, as an example um, over here. While this won't print anything to screen, uh, what we can do is actually look in the work directory where this process has been executed um, and actually see if these files have been created. So here, example has been executed. Uh, we now have this hash number, so we can go and look in the work directory um, to see what's there. And we can see that we have chunk underscore one and the chunk archive um, zipped file, um, which have been created here as a part of this script. So we know it's worked. Um, which is great. What we can also do as part of the script block is actually specify what language we want it to be interpreted as. And we can do this using a shebang declaration. So here at the top of the script block, um, in this example, we have this Python um, shebang and we have some Python script in here. Down here, we have uh, the process being executed as part of the workflow. So again, I'm just gonna copy and paste this in. Just gonna save that and we can execute this again. Um, I'm just gonna keep executing this as nextflow run um, snippet.nf. Um, so I'll just keep writing on top of this file here just to make it a little bit easier to track um, and for me to execute quickly. So again, um, what I want to do this time is actually look to see if this was executed because there aren't any um, files being created. So I can look into the work directory and I'm going to look at the command.sh file. So this is a file, this is the code that was actually executed uh, for this process. And you can see here that the shebang was carried over um, so that when this was executed, it was interpreted as Python because of that. Okay. Uh, moving on, 6.1.1 is about script parameters. Um, so this is just noting that they can be defined dynamically as a part of your script. Um, so here, for example, we have params.data, and in this case, it is world. Um, and this has been uh, included as a Nextflow variable here, um, using the params.data um, and the dollar sign to show that it is a variable. I'm gonna copy and paste it in there. Click save again. Um, so this won't actually print anything to screen. What I should do um, is I'm going to include this debug statement. Um, so debug is used to um, debug your code. Um, we have an echo statement. It can be quite nice to actually show what is being generated without having to go into the work file and look at the command.sh. Um, so I'm just going to run that again. We can see that foo was um, executed successfully last time. Um, but this time um, we're going to debug. We have the debug equals true. Um, and we can see that hello world has been printed to screen. So the world has been interpreted as a variable by the script block. Um, one thing worth, worth noting is that because the next flow uses the same uh, bash syntax for variable substitution and strings, uh, bash environment variables need to be escaped using this, um, the backslash character. Um, so just to show this, I'm just going to copy and paste it in again. So um, we can just run uh, the snippet. Oh, I actually want to add debug in there. Debug true. Just so I don't have to go and look in the work directory. Um, you can see that is executed successfully. Um, with debug, this should print to screen. Yep, so the current directory is, in this case, the work directory, so where this is actually getting executed. But if we want to escape, or if we don't want to escape, uh, we can just run this again, and we can see that this should be the work directory which I'm currently in, uh, where I've executed the script. Um, so you see that it's the workspace, workspace Gitpod uh, NF training, and I can um, run that again to show that is where I am. 
that can get quite complicated though. Um, so if you do have lots of um, different bash variables that you want to sort of use in the same script, um, you might want to consider sort of flipping everything and specifying your next flow variables uh, using a different syntax. So here is an example of this where um, we're using a shell block. So this is one of the differences here to actually um, do this. You need to change script to shell. Instead of double quotes, you have single quotes. So we can copy this again. I'm just going to put this in here and just hit save and just run this. So because of the exclamation and curly brackets, um, this will be interpreted as a nextflow variable rather than a bash variable, um, like everything else in the script is being interpreted as. Um, so here, oh, I do want to add in a debug. Debug true. Um, I want to see this as um, in the command line. So that's just, um, like I said, it's, it's debugging. So it's a nice way to print it to screen. Um, we can see this has been interpreted as a variable. If we remove this and try to do it um, as we normally would uh, with a nextflow variable, what is having the dollar sign in front, um, we will find that this fails. Yep, so here we have um, an error message um, that the params is an unbound variable, so it wasn't uh, wasn't identified. Okay, um, that is something to consider whenever you're writing your script, if you are trying to use something to um, you know, address your current directory or something else about a relative path, um, you do need to be a little bit careful about um, what is a bash variable and what is a nextflow variable. Moving on to 6.1.2, which is conditional scripts. Um, in this example, we have a, um, some if else statements. So this will be kind of like your, your typical um, if this, else, do that. Here we are using the parameters compress. So if it is gzip, um, it'll execute this block. If it is uh, bzip2, it'll execute this block. And if it's neither of those, it'll throw this, this error. Um, again, we're just going to copy and paste it in here just so we can show this. Uh, we have the gzip up the top. Um, I want to show you the results here. So I'm going to wrap these in some echo statements and use debug. And I'll add in my debug equals true. So I'm just going to run this again because this is gzip. This has been defined as this parameter. Um, we should find that um, we get this echo gzip command, which is what we're doing. But if we want to change this to uh, compress bzip2, uh, we can quickly and easily change this, um, change the execution, um, and we'll find that this, um, this second command would be executed, which is the bzip2. Cool. Um, so that's just something you might consider if you do sort of have these um, sort of divergent points where if you have one file type, you might want to do one thing. If you have another, you might want to do something else. Um, so that's quite a cool um, cool way to do that. Okay, so moving on to inputs. Um, as a reminder, when we have our processes, everything that is needed for that process needs to be sort of moved into the same directory. It needs to be um, sort of put there by channels um, because everything is happening as sort of isolated units. So each process is happening in a, in a separate work folder. And if a file or information isn't there, then it won't be available to be included as a part of that process. Um, so because of that, we need to specify our inputs. Generally, our inputs will have a uh, input qualifier as well as an arbitrary name. When I say generally, um, they should all have a qualifier and an arbitrary name. Um, and we have this example here. So we have um, num, which is a channel of one, two, and three. Um, we've already got debug in here and we have a value. So there are different types of inputs that you can specify. One of them is values, the other is path, which are probably your two main uh, types of inputs that you'll be using. Um, here we have echo process uh, job X. So this will just print this to screen um, because we have the debug um, and we can run this down here. So I'm just gonna copy this and show you this as an example. We can get rid of the compressed gzip, although it probably wouldn't have failed if I did include it. Um, so again, this is just taking channel of one, two, and three, and it's going to echo uh, process job x. The x is um, defined here is the variable name, uh, which is a value. So here we have one, two, and three uh, printed out as process job, as you expect here based on the script. 
Um, we can also do this with paths. So um, the last one was a value, but if we want to use a path, so this would actually be specifying a file, not just a piece of information. Um, here, we're taking a path, um, data, ggal, um, so everything here that is um, with the glob pattern and then um, .fq in this, in this folder. Um, we are including this as a path, so sample.fastq is what it's getting named. Um, and then here, we're using list to uh, include this as an out file. Um, this is a bit of a weird example, actually, because it would only print um, sample.fastq um, to the screen. So I might just skip over that and focus on this, um, which is how you can use variable um, names when you are sort of um, specifying your, um, in this case, like printing to screen. So this will list everything with the next flow variable sample, which is here um, specified as a path, um, which is going to take reads from the parameters, um, reads from the channel from path. So to actually look at this and explain it in a slightly uh, clearer way, I'm just going to run this again. And what we would expect here is the data GG, um, GGL, um, which is going to have all of the files in this folder, which have .fastq at the end, .fq, um, all printed to screen. So the sample is being dynamically generated or used um, based on the sample name or the input name. Uh, in this case, it was a far path to the sample. So all of those are included there. Um, yeah, so you can also get a slightly uh, more interesting um, example by oh, um, by using a slightly different command. Um, but again, this is getting used dynamically um, from the input. Um, the only difference here is that this is getting collected um, into one channel um, for the output. Okay, um, moving on to combining your input channels. Um, so this is something that we've shown and it was already sort of um, sort of outlined sort of tentatively um, here, for example, that you have multiple channels as inputs and each of these are um, essentially positional. So here you have channel one and channel two and you have channel one and channel two here. So these are two different channels that are getting used as the input to the process. Um, and you just specify these on separate lines um, as your input. So again, we can copy this and paste this in here. Uh, we can run this again. This is getting, uh, this X is used um, for channel one, and this Y is getting used for channel two. Um, and both of these are, uh, excuse me, values. So here we have um, one with A, two with B, and three with C. Um, so each of these channels is getting paired up. We've addressed this a little bit already um, when we're talking about the value channels and Q channels. Um, so down here, for example, when you look at this, um, you'd expect one to be paired with A and two to be paired with B. Um, that's what you'd expect. Um, so one and A and two and B. Um, but because we don't have anything to pair with C and D because of that poison pill at the end of Q channels, um, you wouldn't expect this to be printed uh, to your screen. However, here in this example, because we have a value, this uh, number, this this value one, would get used multiple times, and you'd expect to see uh, one and A, two and one and B, and one and C. Okay, um, so moving down to input repeaters. So I said previously that there would um, there are kind of two main inputs, which are paths and values, but you can also have this each. Um, so this is um, a qualifier that allows you to repeat the execution of the process um, each time, um, and you item you item in a collection every time your data is received. Um, so in this example, we have the sequences which are coming from uh, this data props folder. Um, so going back over here, we can see data um, props folder, and we have six different files in here. All of these would be getting in included um, as a part of this path or in this channel. Um, and here we have three different methods. So for each of these files, it will be executed, uh, or this, this process will be executed um, for each of the different methods. So we'd expect to have 18 different um, sort of outputs from this. To actually show this, what we can do is paste this in here. Um, so this is a good way, for example, that if you wanted to have different parameters or a slightly different execution of um, a process on the same file, you can sort of bring in the files and then say do this 
um, using each with each of these parameters. So here you can see that we've got um, each of these files and it is getting uh, shown here um, three times. So we have this um, 0027, 0027, 0027 with regular uh, the PSI coffee and the espresso. Okay, um, so that's really input repeaters. Um, there's an example here which you can sort of play around um, with that where you have different methods um, to actually run this command. What I will do though is move on to outputs. So outputs um, are what we're kind of specifying or what we want to use as an output channel. So we specify what we want to come in. Outputs is what we want to come out and these can be um, sort of defined um, here. So again, you have an output qualifier which you'd expect to be probably values or paths. Um, you can give it some output name. So this can be um, arbitrary, anything you want it to be, um, but it is named. Um, this is where this sort of variable and it can be dynamically named. We also have this emit here. Uh, we don't really talk about emit too much as a part of this training. Um, but it is used to name the output um, outside of the process. So for example, if you were to look at um, this emit index, you would be able to specify this by saying um, salmon underscore index uh, dot out dot index. And this would refer to this particular channel, um, which in this case is just salmon, uh, the path to salmon. And that's how that, that output would be named. Um, I think we'll come back to this a little bit uh, later on when we talk about modules. Um, okay, so here is an example. Uh, we have these three uh, methods, which are a list. Um, and if you were to execute this, what you'd find is that this would echo this list um, as a file, um, which is a bit of a strange example, but uh, I guess we can show it. So again, um, this is going to be a list. This isn't a channel. This is just going to be taken as a value and it's going to be um, given out as a value output. Um, so this will just be a block um, here, which is just going to be the values um, which are included here as a part of this list. So we see uh, received and then we have the list in there. However, in reality, um, you might want this to be a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more um, sort of flexible. Um, you can do something like this, which is taking a path qualifier. So it's taking, or it's going to use um, the results.txt as an output. And this will be taking a random number, which is going to be put inside this text file. Um, what we're actually doing here is actually just printing um, it.txt. So this will be printing this to screen anyway. Um, but let's show it. Again, I'm just going to copy and paste this in and save it. And we can run this. I'm not sure if this will work, actually. I think you need to escape this. Yep, so we've got an error there, um, which is a good excuse to troubleshoot. Um, so I think this needs to be um, used with the backslash there. Like we talked about earlier, um, just with that sort of next flow variable versus bash variable, um, you have to be a little bit careful about that sometimes. Yep, so um, received. Um, now we have a number in there. Um, so yeah, if you're trying to run this straight out of the example, um, that'll fail without without that. Um, so yeah, um, as it explains here in the above example, the process random number creates a file name result.txt containing a random number. Um, and that's sent over the receiver.channel uh, when the task is complete. So it could be passed on to um, a downstream process. Here, um, this is an example of when you have multiple output files. Um, so we sort of touched on this a little bit during the hello.nf example as part of session one, um, that when you have multiple outputs, you can kind of do something like add a glob pattern um, and then use this operator flat map to group all of these together. Um, here, for example, I'm just going to replace all of that again. So again, I'm just copying and pasting this on top and using it as an example here. So when we run this, it's just taking a wee moment. Um, all of this is getting printed to the screen. Um, because we've used um, flat map, we can see it um, in this nice format. If we were to remove this, um, from here, we will see that the output is a little bit different. So we'll expand on operators more very shortly. 
Um, this is just an example that you can use um, in operators um, to kind of like really define um, your outputs dynamically. Yep, so you see here file chunk A, A, B, and A, C, and A, D um, has all been sort of grouped together um, in this list without the without the flattened, or the flat map rather. Okay, um, I've touched on this a little bit already, um, but you can name your outputs dynamically. So here, for example, in this block, we have um, this value X, which is also specified here. So it has been used as a variable to name the output. So again, this, this value X, which has been taken as an input, is being used to name the output um, here. And we can also see it down here. So this is when it is being used in the script block um, to give it a name based on the input or the name of the value input. And it's also used here as the output. So this is a good example of what um, something you might do if you're trying to name a sample um, using a piece of like a sample ID or a piece of metadata. Um, so you might kind of mine that from a value or include it in a value as an input, and then you can sort of name it in the output dynamically. Yep, so you can see here dog, cat, and sloth. So these are the species that are included here. This was included um, as the value here. And then it is being used here as a part of the output. Okay, um, so this is the next section, uh, 6.3.5 is composite inputs and outputs. And this is where we sort of start talking about uh, tuples a little bit more. So tuples are when you have um, sort of multiple um, so elements, multiple parts of, of your input um, and outputs in this case. Um, and each of these can have their own qualifier. So in this case, we have a tuple. So this can be like a channel. Um, so here, the channel from file pairs, if you remember from session one, we had kind of that base name at the start, and then we had two files included um, in a list at the end. So we have a value, which is going to be um, that base name or the sample ID. And here we have the path to the actual files that were grouped um, in from file pairs. And we have the same here, an output tuple. We have the sample ID again, um, but we have this path to sample.bam, which is being generated here as a part of this process. Ooh. So here um, we just have foo, which is going to execute this process. Um, I'm just going to view the channel outputs. Um, so again, I can copy that. and just paste it in here. We'll run that again. And we can see here this time that we've actually got um, the two files uh, listed at the start. So these are values. Um, and at the end here, we have the actual BAM file that is that is being generated. Okay, so we will continue on down um, to the when statement. So when declarations they should find a condition that must be verified in order to actually execute the process. Um, here, for example, we have this faster.name and we're sort of requesting that it has to be this pattern um, to be executed. Um, this is a relatively, um, um, I guess, complex example, but you can sort of see this pattern here, this bb11 um, dot. Um, without that, it won't be executed, um, or the files won't be used. Um, so here we have this uh, bb11, and if we were to hypothetically change this to um, add a few more ones in there, and we tried it again, the win statement won't be satisfied, so it won't uh, won't run, that channel won't be filled, um, the process will probably appear, but it won't be executed. Yep. Okay, uh, moving on to directives. So directive declarations allow the definition of optional settings that affect the execution of the current process without affecting the semantic of the task itself. Um, so here, for example, we have CPUs, memory, and a container. Um, in this example, this example won't actually work. Um, but we have seen these in the past when we use tasks.cpus as a part of hello.nf. Was it hello.nf or one of the one of the scripts we looked at in session one? Um, and there are a number of different options here that are defined um, that you might be interested in using to help really tune um, the execution of your process. Um, using a real world example, again, this is the salmon.index module. Um, you can see the tag here, a label, um, as well as a container, excuse me, conda and container declarations, uh, directives rather. Um, and some information there to actually execute it using the information um, provided. 
Okay, uh, moving on to organizing outputs. So we're seeing this a little bit already uh, in our development of the RNA seq pipeline. Then we use publish dir to specify where the files should be stored. Um, I'm just going to quickly clear this and show you that um, we do have. I'm going to get rid of that transcript don't index. Okay, so that's been generated um, by me by mistake. Um, I'm going to get rid of my work directory. Um, I'll just show you that again. So um, we know what's there. So clear that. What I want to do now is actually uh, copy this. Um, so what's happening here is we have this publish dir. Um, so this is the the directive of where this, this the information from this file should be published. We have the params.outdir, so we've seen this previously um, as well when we're developing our RNA-seq pipeline. Um, we've got this defined up here as my results. Um, down here we have the bams.file, so this is where the file will be, and with the option mode to copy, so this is where um, this will actually be stored. Um, going across from the next slide documentation, there's a lot of options here about how you can um, sort of publish this or have, have this stored and, and created um, as a part of your results rather than work directory. Um, so let's go back here and have a look at it so you can see what um, you are expecting. Next flow, run snippet.nf. So what we're going to expect is that we will have a folder which is called my results um, with a bam.files folder inside it. Um, and we can do this by going ls my results. And you can see this bams.file. Um, and inside of that, we can see all of the files that were created. In a slightly more complicated example, um, we can also use um, semantic subdirectories um, using the same um, published directory, uh, published dir directive. So I'm just going to copy this, but as you can see here, we've got these patterns, um, and these are used to sort of collect the outputs into these folders. Um, so this code here is a little more complicated as well, but um, what's happening is that these files are being created, um, and then up here using the published dir directive, they're being sort of sorted and organized um, into output folders. Again, I'm just going to quickly run this. So this has been run uh, five different times. Um, and now if we were to look in our my results folder, um, you'll see there's much more in here. And we have these different files or different folders that have been created. Um, and sort of stored in different places uh, because of what we've defined up here. So counts and outlooks, for example, uh, we can see those here. Okay, um, I think that's the end of processes. So what we will do now is move on to operators. So as a reminder, operators are the methods that we use to really sort of manipulate a channel uh, by transforming the values in some way um, to help them sort of match between two different processes um, or apply some user provided rules. There are seven main groups of operators. Um, we've been exposed to some of these operators already, um, but if you do want to use, uh, look at these in more detail, there's a lot of really great Nextflow reference documentation, um, but these groups are filtering, transforming, uh, splitting, combining, forking, maths, and other what we will do now is look at some basic operators. So these are operators that um, we've either talked about already, um, have been sort of uh, used or shown in some way, but we haven't properly explained, um, as well as some that you might expect to use quite frequently as a part of uh, developing your own pipelines using Nextflow. So uh, this is a basic example. We have a channel of, so this is a channel factory, uh, one, two, three, and four. We have the channel, which we've called nums now. Um, we have nums.map, map being an operator. And what this is doing is taking every item. Um, this doesn't have to be it. It could be some other name that you've called it. Um, but it is taking every item and it is squaring it by itself or is timesing it by itself to become a square. Uh, we've called this square or this channel square now. Um, reviewed it. So instead of seeing 1, 2, 3, 4, um, you might see 1, 4, 9, and 16 um, as an output. To show this, uh, we always copy and paste this over here again. Let's click Save. And we'll run the snippet again. So again, we're taking the channel of one, two, three, and four, 
um, we're taking every item and squaring it by itself. What you'll notice about this is I've actually copied um, this example here because um, you don't actually need to specify each of these as a new um, channel each time. You can just sort of chain these together um, to create um, sort of a, a more simplified, what I find more readable um, way of, of using operators on a channel. So uh, going back here, we do see that square, so it's 1, 4, 9, and 16. Uh, produced by one, two, three, and four. We've also used view a lot. So explaining what this does in a little bit more detail, uh, the view operator prints the items submitted by a channel to the console standard output, um, appending a new line character to each item. Uh, for example, when we have a channel of uh, foo bar and baz, and if we were to view that, you would expect to see foo bar and baz um, as separate lines in the output uh, or on, on the terminal. Um, an optional closer parameter can be specified um, to customize how items are printed. For example, um, here, so using the view, um, we've actually just added in um, this little hyphen in here so that when this is printed, you would expect to see um, the hyphen before every item. We've also used map a lot. So the map operator applies a function of your choosing to every item by a channel and returns the items obtained as a new channel. Um, this function applied is called the, the mapping function. Um, as I've used it extensively, um, referred to it extensively, um, and it can be expressed with the closure as shown in the example below. So here um, we have a channel of hello and world. We are taking each of those as items, and in this case we are adding um, the reverse operator. So this is going to be um, reversing hello and world. Um, so they'll be printed in reverse. So again, I'm just going to copy and paste that over here, and oh, and execute it. So you can see that those are just printed in reverse. Um, if you were to remove this, for example, you would just sort of print um, every item again. Um, so I'll just show that. Um, so that dot reverse was the, the part that was actually making it um, go in reverse. There wasn't any special uh, magic there. Um, a map can also associate a generic tuple to each element. Um, it can contain any data. Um, so here, for example, we are taking hello world um, and we're using the map take world. So sort of item we've called this word rather um, and we're sort of making this into uh, this this list where we have word and word.size word.size will generate um, a number based on the size of the word and here in the view um, we have this sort of tuple structure where we have the word and the length or len um, which is going to take word and word.size and then the word will contain uh, the length or len of letters um, so this is quite a cool example, actually. So I think we'll put that in here um, and look at the output. So uh, one thing to remember here is that this, because this becomes a next flow variable, um, because it's inside the, the speech marks, um, you do need to have the, the dollar sign there. Hello contains five letters and world contains five letters. Cool. Um, something I think we, I think we did this in part of script seven. Uh, we have the, or maybe script six. Um, we have the mix operator, which combines the items emitted by two more channels into a single channel. So here we have channel dot of one two three, channel of a b, and channel of z. Uh, we can have c one and then mix in c two and c three, uh, being the three named channels, and then view the output, um, which would give us something like this. Um, again, I think the output will be um, what we've just seen, but it is quite nice to see um, live. And then what we will do is just. Um, show you that you could, you know, change this and it wouldn't um, throw anything off too much. Oh, just for consistency. Um, and here we're actually going to get rid of C2. Um, so as you can see down the bottom there, we have uh, channel one, which has been mixed with, um, previously it was C2 and C3. Uh, we're just going to do this again, but just show you that you can um, quite quickly and flexibly edit these. Um, in your pipelines. Yep, so one, one, two, two, three. Um, so one thing to remember here is that this can be sort of put back in any order. This doesn't have to be um, sort of in a set structure. Um, that's something to be mindful of if you are trying to match or pair things. Um, 
yeah so um, that's just a warning there kind of explaining that in more detail we also have this flatten operator so the flatten operator transforms the channel in such a way that every tuple is flattened so that every entry is emitted as a sole element by the resulting channel um, so here for example um, we have um, the channel of foo and bar which are these um, two lists up here and we have the flatten so this is they're being treated as tuples um, and then you get flattened so that they are emitted as sole elements. Um, again, what we can do is we'll just show this over here. Um, so I've just copied and pasted that in. I haven't changed anything. It's taking foo and bar, being these two um, sets of numbers, and we're flattening them. Yep, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six showing out there in the in the terminal. There is also a collect, so collect operator collects all the items submitted by a channel, and a list and returns them, uh, returns the object as a sole emission. Uh, so here, for example, we have channel of one two three four, and it's being collected uh, into one. So we used this when we were doing, um, like we were using multi QC as a part of script one, uh, script uh, session one, uh, script six or seven. Um, so this was a way that everything was collected into one channel, and it could be put into the into the process um, at once. Um, so again, we can. Copy and paste this here. Save that and click run. And while that's running, um, we can have a look back over here and see how we used. So here we have like mix and click, these two operators, which was first to mix um, the quant channel with the FastQC channel, and then we collected it um, at the end here, um, which is what the same thing that we're doing here um, in a slightly different way so that everything is being um, sort of collected, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, into one one channel. Group tuple is also quite a useful um, operator. So the group tuple operator collects tuples or lists of values emitted by the source channel, uh, grouping the elements by a shared um, that share the same key, and it'll emit a new tuple object for each uh, distinct key collection. Um, so this is an example here. We've got channel of one A, one B, two C, three B, one C, two A, three D. Um, all of these have been grouped, and you'll see that they are sort of grouped here um, as an output. Um, it's quite a nice example here um, using base name. Um, okay, um, moving down to join. So the join operator creates a channel that joins together the items submitted by um, two channels with a matching key. Um, the key is defined by default as the first element in each item emitted. So here, for example, we have X, Y, and Z, X, Y, and Z, um, and the output is just join these together. Um, in this case, it is left join right, because um, we have left and right here, and we are viewing this. Uh, what you will notice that P is missing because it wasn't able to join with anything. Uh, finally, uh, we have branch. So branch is another, um, I think it's quite a cool, cool operator. Um, it allows you to forward the items emitted by a source channel to one or more outputs based on um, some sort of test. Um, with selection criteria. Um, here we have channel of 1, 2, 3, 40, and 50, and we can use the branch operator, and we can specify them as either small or large by taking each item and testing if it's smaller or larger than 10, and we can see the results. Um, this is very similar to what um, you might expect using the emit for an output, um, that we can use the result dot small. So this is specifying um, the results that are small versus the results that are large, and we're viewing those, um, and we can use the item is small or large. So uh, what we can do is pop that over here and paste it. Ooh, uh, terminal. So what you can see is that these have been uh, printed. Uh, we've got result. Um, dot small dot view. Um, if you were to move one of these hypothetically, um, you wouldn't get all of these um, printed out. But you can see that the branch has put them into the small or large. Um, here, just showing the small. Um, you have one is small, two is small, and three is small, rather than having them sort of mixed and blended in there like that. So this is a situation where you might sort of specify this or do this, and then sort of push that data down one way and push that data down another based on um, whatever criteria it is um, that you've selected. Okay, um, that's the wrong documentation. So as I said earlier, um, there's actually a lot more um, 
there are many, many more operators that you can use. Um, we have a huge number listed here, um, many of which I haven't um, even touched on. Um, all of these are listed here. So filtering, uh, reduction, passing text, combining, combining channels, forking channels, uh, maths, and other. Uh, these are some of the groups I mentioned before. Um, and there's lots of really good examples and explanations of all of these in the documentation. Sorry, that's quite small. Um, but as you can see here, there's, there's a huge amount of documentation and lots of different ways that you can use operators to really sort of um, modify and manipulate your channels um, to, to test them and, and sort of share them uh, between different processes. Okay, um, with that, we will move on to Groovy introductions. Okay, so now is an introduction to Groovy. So as already mentioned, as a part of session one, uh, Nextflow is a domain-specific language implemented on top of Groovy. You do not need to be an expert in Groovy to write your uh, your pipelines with Nextflow, although having a little bit of understanding does definitely help. So what we'll do now is just kind of work through um, kind of some of the basic structures and idioms for Groovy, um, just to kind of give you a little bit of exposure, um, and hopefully it'll make some of these things that we've written previously, um, it might have been a little bit strange, make a little bit more sense. So starting off with our printing values, we did this already as a part of, I think it was script one um, here. So we're just printing, printing LN or printing line. Um, in this case, we were just printing um, the parameter.reads. Printing is a really uh, nice way of just showing um, something to the screen. Um, it is different from viewing a channel. Uh, obviously viewing a channel is viewing um, how your channel is structured, so the finals and values that are being passed around. Whether this uh, print line can just show you um, a string uh, printed to your window. So here, next flow run snippet.f. I'm still using snippet.f um, to do all of this. Um, this is going to print the string. Um, this is now bigger. So you can quickly just modify that um, and show that you'll still just be able to print this straight to your, your screen. Um, there isn't any magic involved in this. Um, we've also talked a little bit already about comments. So you can either use single comments or these multi-line comments um, using the, the slashes. Um, and the, uh, in this case, an asterisk. So you can just keep adding in lines here. This is still the same comment. Um, and none of that will be um, included as a part of the, the script when it's executed. Um, so this is just like normally commenting stuff out so that um, it isn't picked up by the, by the, um, the program that's running it. Cool. Um, variables. Uh, Obviously, we've used variables quite a lot already. Um, using um, variables with Groovy, um, you can define it by simply assigning um, a value to it. So here, for example, we have um, x equals 1, x equals the date, um, x equals, um, I think that's pi, um, x equals the boolean false, and x equals the string high. Um, and again, we can just sort of dump all of this in here, um, and this will just print the screen um, because we've got this print line um, in there as well. So again, we've got one, uh, the date, uh, we've got what I think is pi, um, false and high. Okay, um, we can also use um, this def keyword uh, to define uh, local variables. So def equals 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 foo, excuse me, def x equals foo. Um, you can see that these are used uh, quite extensively here as a part of the script block, um, just to define some arguments, for example. Um, and as a rule, def should always be used when defining uh, variables local to a function uh, or a closure. So for example, as a part of that process, um, in this case, it was salmon index. Um, you can also create lists. So a list object can be defined by placing the list items in a square bracket. So here we have list uh, 10, 20, 30, 40. Um, so we do iterate over this a little bit. So I'm gonna replace it up here. So we just have a list at the top. Um, you can also use indexes to um, get different parts of this list. So here, for example, we have list zero um, and list.get. Um, to index, you can use square brackets or list.get um, with round brackets. Um, so we can put both of those in here. It does start at zero. So 10 will be zero, 21, 32, 43. Um, so just as an example, I will add in one there as well and then execute this. So what we should see printed the screen here is two tens and one twenty. Yep. 
Um, you can also sort of test um, using Groovy. So here, for example, we are asking for the size of the list um, and asking to print that to screen. So we will replace this and put this in here. Um, we're going to print the line, which is going to ask us for the size. So again, we can just run next flow, um, snippet.nf, um, and this should give us the size of this list. Cool. Um, we can also use um, the assert keyword to test if a condition is true, um, similar to an if function. Um, here, Groovy will print nothing if it's correct. So if we were to assert 0 equals 10, um, what we should see is that next flow in this case will run, but um, we won't have anything printed out because um, the assertion is true. However, if we were to change this to another word, so in this case, we're just going to call it um, assert equals next flow one, and run that again, we will get an error message because um, the assertion is false, it has been tested, um, and it has failed. Yep, no such variable next flow one. Um, but of course, if you were to try and test it with another number, um, so there is actually looking for the variable, uh, which didn't exist. You can also have different numbers in there. Um, we'll treat this as a string as well uh, with some numbers, and we sort of get uh, varying uh, error messages depending on what was tested and why it failed. Great. Um, so you can also do slightly more um, sort of interesting or, or more dynamic ways, dynamic ways of testing. Uh, so here, for example, we have lists of 0, 1, and 2. Um, we are looking at minus 1, so this will be um, the first element from the reverse end, or the first, first item from the other end, um, so in this case it would be 2. Um, so list minus 1 equals 2. Um, here we have minus 1, 2, 0, so this would be uh, doing everything in the opposite direction, um, and it's testing if that list equals reverse. So this is just kind of showing that you can do these quite um, sort of complex um, assertions to see if they are true or not. Um, so I've actually got a new list, so we can get rid of that. Um, and this should um, respond without um, any issues. But what you can also find, um, if we were to change this to uh, this, so this is actually asking for the second in the reverse uh, in the opposite direction, uh, this should also pass because we've got um, minus 2 equals 1, which is the second in from the other end. Cool. Um, so here's a big list of different assertions that you can make, um, different ways that you can test them. Um, there's a full list of extension methods provided by Groovy, and you can find those uh, by clicking on this link here. So um, maps are also an important part of the Groovy language that is used extensively in Nextflow. So maps are like lists. They have an arbitrary key instead of an integer. Therefore, the syntax is very much um, aligned. So here, for example, we have um, a map which has got a0, b1, and c equals 2. And you can access this um, in a conventional square bracket syntax um, as shown here. So map um, a, so you can specify a, which would be this 0 um, equals 0. So you can sort of test it this way. Um, you can use map.b. So this is a little bit like we'd use with the out.emit. Um, as I mentioned previously, and we can check that b equals 1. And here we can use the map.get uh, c equals 2. Um, so if we were to run this, uh, I think we need to copy this first. Um, so here we've created a new, uh, we've created a map. Here we will copy this in. And as you can see, that this runs uh, reasonably well. So again, by not getting uh, any error messages, it's showing that the assertions are correct. Okay, um, down here is just a way um, that you can show that you can actually modify the map. Um, and it's in a similar syntax to adding values to a list. So um, map A equals X, so we're replacing uh, the value of A with X. Here we're replacing the value of B with Y, and here we're replacing the value of C uh, with Z. And then we can check that this is true by asserting map equals AX, BY, and CZ. Um, again, uh, we'll just quickly run that just to show that um, that is indeed successful. So again, um, there are lots of different ways to kind of replace a value in a map. 
Um, these are just some of them uh, here, or three different ways here at least. Ooh, what's happening there? Snippet at line one. Uh, okay, so this is because I um, deleted the list. Um, so I deleted this line here and um, nothing was there to um, actually replace. So that should work this time. Great. Okay, um, 8.6 here, we have a little bit about string interpolation. Um, so string literals can be defined by enclosing them with either a single quote or a double quote. Um, here we have fox equals quick, um, fox color brown, and we can print that together. Um, so I'm just going to copy that out and show you here. Um, so these are just ways that you can sort of uh, stick your strings together. Uh, but again, you can just run that using nextflow run snippet. Um, we've used this join here to join uh, everything in fox color uh, together. So all of these different individual strings have been joined together. Um, and we get the quick brown fox printed uh, quite nicely. Okay, um, something else worth noting is that you do get um, some interesting effects of using uh, forward and backslashes. Uh, so it's something to be mindful of is that um, using the backslash before a T will create a tab um, in Groovy. So when you look at the two of these, um, because this hasn't been uh, effectively um, escaped, um, it is going to be interpreted as a, um, a tab, sorry, excuse me, um, and that's why you get this sort of um, weird elongated effect, uh, because tabs have been introduced between uh, these letters and the T's have been omitted. Okay, um, moving down to 8.7, we have multi-line strings. Um, here you can specify uh, multi-line strings, much like we did um, over here as a part of, uh, I think it was script two, uh, where we introduced the, the log. Um, we've got these multi-line strings here, um, and that's all we included as a part of, in this case, it was log.info, um, but it's an application of why you might uh, want to use multi-line strings for um, a series of lines of text. Okay, um, if statements. So we looked at the statements a little bit already as a part of the uh, uh, operators when we looked at if else um, different script blocks. Um, so that was down here. I think it was under scripts, conditional scripts. Yep. So we got if and else or else if. Um, going back to the introduction to Groovy, um, you can see here that you can kind of use these um, statements again. Um, to test something, and then if it's true, do this, and if it's not, do that. Um, so if and else. Here, for example, we have um, x equals 1, and if x is less than 10, it would print hello. Um, there's no else statement here, but um, down here, for example, you could use it in a slightly uh, more advanced way. So you have a list of 1, 2, and 3, and you have list um, does not equal null, and list um, is of a size greater than 1. You can print the list, else you can print that this list is empty. So in this case, it would print that, um, it would print the list, but if it was empty, it would say that the list is empty. So this is quite a, a good way. Um, there are other ways to do this, of course, but you could test if a channel was empty. Um, and if it was, you wouldn't bother executing that process or even trying to execute it. Um, but if it was full, then you could try and do something with it. Down here for 8.9, we have a for statement. So this is really like your for loops. Um, so this is just going to iterate through, um, in this case, um, It'll iterate printing hello world um, a number of times because it is going to execute each time for each iteration of i. Um, so I'm just going to go back here. I'll close those two and replace this here. So uh, for the integer uh, i equals zero, um, go through this increasing um, each time. So as long as i is less than 3, it'll iterate through uh, 0, 1, and 2, saying hello world um, with i, which has been defined up here as the, as the int. Um, OK, um, so functions. Um, it is also possible to define custom functions into a script. Um, so you might need to do this occasionally, is that you might um, want to sort of specify a custom script just to test something um, regularly or um, apply something to your data. 
Um, so here, for example, um, we have this example, um, which we test. Um, so this is all quite complicated, but really what it's doing is it's just uh, manipulating these numbers and seeing if it equals, um, or is testing if this equation is true. That's probably um, all we really need to know. Um, so again, we can just test this, and then we can assert um, the function that we have defined um, and testing if the number, which is an integer, so a number, um, equals what we're expecting it to, which in this case is 89. If we were to sort of change this to uh, 489, we'd expect it to, to fail. Um, so this is a slightly more complicated example, but um, it's just returning n, so it's testing if this number is less than 2, um, and then it's either going to say it's 1 or um, do this equation on it. So for example, if we were to replace this with um, with zero, um, we can check if that equals one. So this is still um, correct because in this case it was um, n is less than two and it'll be given one uh, because it was true rather than uh, what would be given if it was false. Okay, um, closures. So closures are something that we've kind of addressed a little bit um, on and off. Um, closures are the Swiss army knife of the Groovy Nextflow programming. Um, and simply a closure block, uh, closure is a block of code that can be passed as an argument to a function. Um, a closure can be also used to define an anonymous function. So here, for example, we have um, square equals it times it. And then we can use assert square dot call five equals 25. So it's testing. Um, we are calling square and seeing if 5 equals um, 5 times 5 equals 25. Um, here is without the call, um, and we can still test that it equals 81. Um, so just to show this, uh, we can put this in here, and this is the, the closure that we've created. So this is kind of like I said, the anonymous function. Um, and we can see that square equals call cool, 5 equals 25 and square 9 equals 81. Um, because it's true, um, everything is passed and we don't get any error messages. Um, of course, this can also be applied um, in a slightly more um, complicated way again. So we're going to collect um, everything in this list. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and then we're going to square them all. And we can print that to screen. And what you'd expect is 1, 4, 9, and 16. So again, all of these are getting squared. Um, we can always use this um, um, sort of expand on this again. So by default, closures take a single parameter called it. Um, to give it a different name, use the the, um, the slash um, sort of kind of like a little arrow syntax. Um, so we have square and we have num equals num times num. So it's taking, um, in this case, the different name. It could have been it. We've called it num. Um, and then we've times it by itself again there. So um, again, you can sort of like create these more um, complicated methods. Um, so for example, when the method each is applied to a map, um, it can take a closure with two arguments um, to pass, to which it passes the key value pair um, for each entry into the map objective. For example, um, A and B. So we're going to print um, A or the variable A with value B. Uh, we have a bunch of values here, which are maps. So yeah, Yi Wu, Mark Williams, and Suda. Kamari, um, and when we print those, we get um, them printed like this. So this is kind of, um, it's getting used like a tuple. Um, so A and B um, is going to be separated out. They'd be named separately. And then if you print them, um, we can use them as um, kind of like variables. Cool. Um, so it's worth noting a closure has two other important features. First, it can access and modify variables in the scope where it's defined. Um, and second, a closure can be defined as anonymous manner, meaning that um, it's not given a name, and it's defined in the place where it needs uh, to be used. Um, and here's an example showing both of these features, um, where the result is zero, and we have the values China 1, India 2, USA 3. Um, we've got this key set where each um, result um, and value is being used. So when we copy and paste this into the browser, and we can run this again. So remembering that we've defined result, um, which started off as zero, and then it's being added to and equals um, the value of it. So we're adding in the 
values from it. So the values specified here, so one, two, and three, um, and we are adding those together um, because we've used this key set um, and each. Um, that is slightly more advanced, so please don't uh, worry about that too much if that doesn't make any sense at all. Okay, um, I'll finish this section by saying that uh, there are many, many more resources. Um, so you can follow either of these links, um, and there's a lot of information here about getting started with Groovy in more detail, um, as well as there's this book, um, which uh, if you're me, I'd probably just start off with the website, but if it is something you want to deep dive into, um, this is quite a nice resource. Okay, uh, so now we'll move on to modularization. Okay, so to finish off today, uh, we will look at modularization in more detail. So we have been exposed a little bit to modularization already as part of session one and session two, um, and particularly in session two, where we're talking about modules and sub workflows um, and how they can be sort of integrated into your scripts using the Enercore tooling. So uh, what we'll do now is actually take a little bit of a step back and we'll look at the hello.nf example from earlier, um, and we'll sort of convert some of its modules that were included as part of the main hello.nf script into modules stored in a separate modules folder. Um, so what we'll do is we will jump uh, back over to Gitpod um, and we'll reopen the script. So again, this is the hello.nf script that we've used um, previously. Um, we've got the parameters brought in at the top here, which is a greeting, and we've got these two processes, uh, which are split letters and convert to upper. The first thing that I will do is I'm going to cut those and remove them from the script. Uh, make sure you do cut them rather than delete them, because I'm about to paste them into a different folder. A different file rather. I'm going to create a modules.nf file. So this has popped up in my browser. Um, I'm going to paste it in there. No extra formatting is needed. Um, just make sure that your processes have both ends of their curly brackets. I'm going to save that and you can see that it's appeared over in my explorer. What we can do now is include these in our script or in our main script by using the uh, include statements. So going back over to uh, modularization over here in the training material, we can use these statements here. So include split letters from modules and include convert to upper from modules. This modules file is the one that we've just created, um, and it is in the same directory as our hello.nf script. Um, so this does need to be relative to where you are, uh, relative to this main script. I have now saved this, and what we can do is next flow run hello.nf. And what you'll find is that this should run and it'll have the same results as what we had um, initially um, in session one, where we split the letters into chunks of six and we converted those to uppercase um, capital letters in the second process convert to upper. Okay, so that's really cool. Um, we have now removed our processes from our main script and this has really improved the readability. Um, we have both of these stored as um, two different processes in the one modules file. But because they are in the same file, we could also um, make this a little bit easier on ourselves and actually have both of them in the same include statement. So this is just saying include split letters and convert to upper, uh, both of them separated by a semicolon from this modules file. So we can just run that again. Um, and you'll see that both of these are still brought in and run successfully. Great. Um, so that's what I've just done here in the 9.1.2 for multiple imports. Here in 9.1.3, um, this is an example of using multiple aliases. So in some situations, you might want to run a process twice. So you might want to use the same tool to do something to two separate files. Um, as an example, so, um, or as a simple example, what we'll do is we're just going to run split letters twice. Um, we will use the same channel as an input. But for this um, scenario, I want to save or have it um, as a separate channel um, for some for some reason. Um, so here I am going to ask the split letters process to be run twice as a part of the same workflow, and we will see an error. Um, so the process split letters will have been used. Um, if you need to reuse the same component, include it with a different name or include it in a different workflow context. So um, this is considered to be the workflow context. Um, as we'll find out, you can have uh, processes included again as a part of a separate uh, process excuse me, a separate workflow, um, and it can be treated as a sub-workflow. Um, again, we'll explore this very soon. But what I can show you is this example here, where we use aliases. So in this situation, we're including 
uh, split letters as split letters one and two and convert to upper as convert to upper one and two and we are treating uh, both of these or we are using both of these um, by using the aliases in the workflow so again i'm just going to copy out and paste this in um, and what you can see is that everything up here in the workflow is going to run um, each alias is going to be run once but because these aliases are bringing in the modules um, convert to upper and split letters twice um, we do get all of the outputs twice because everything is run uh, in duplicate now okay um, so we also have output definitions um, so we sort of touched on this like a little bit but not in great detail so here is an example of the workflow as it is um, here is an example that we have uh, basically specified um, or given each channel a name so the channel of prems not greeting goes into greetings or channel um, the output of split letters goes into letters dot channel and so on and so on but what we can actually do is explicitly define outputs uh, from one channel to another using dot out so we can remove the channel definitions completely so here this has been turned into this and that we keep using this dot out rather than actually putting it um, into a new um, a new scope uh, excuse me into a new uh, into a new uh, definition so uh, by using this dot out um, we can show that we can directly um, substitute uh, I'll just re sort of reverse this and I'm going to replace this here so I'm still bringing in the modules um, from the modules.ini folder so bringing in these two processes um, but here I'm just using dot out rather than um, creating these channels um, as shown here okay so I'm just going to save that again um, we'll just run it so we'll only see hello world once um, because I've removed that second um, the second usage um, because of those aliases and everything still runs Um, so here's just a note as well saying that process de um, defined if the process defines two more output channels um, each channel could be accessed by indexing the out attribute um, so out zero versus out one um, using using the square brackets um, in our example we only have the the zeroth output um, so we can copy that in and only look at the uh, the first or the zeroth um, output um, so in this case we only see um, one of the two outputs okay so we're seeing both of them um, because it's, it's been flattened I guess um, okay so here's just another little note as well um, alternatively the output definition allows us to use the emit statement to define a name to identify that can be used uh, to reference the channel and the external scope uh, for example try adding the emit statement to convert to upper um, in your file um, so here we're going to add the emit upper so this is naming the output um, we've talked about this very very briefly um, already as well so this is going to be back in the modules.nf file um, we can pop that in there very good a couple of typos there now when we use the workflow uh, block um, you see here that we've got out.upper so we're using the named upper which we've given it using the emit we can copy that out and oops um, paste that in here so again the big difference here is that we're actually um, using the upper to define it um, or to select that channel yep so we have hello world um, so it's still using this channel um, which is just the standard out if we had a separate channel in there um, you would you might want to name it name it separately with something else um, there's examples of this here um, this is again the seminar index um, unicorn module um, we have the index um, and the versions being the two um, channels that are emitted and they've been named uh, index and version respectively so if you were to sort of specify this uh, in your pipeline it'll be something like salmon underscore index um, dot out dot index or dot versions okay um 9.2.1 is an example of how you can use pipes um, to join up all of your different um 
sort of the outputs from one channel into another, you can pipe them. Um, so as an example of that, um, if we're just to replace this out, we'll substitute this for our workflow. Um, you'll see that just the output of one channel is being piped into another. Um, this works here because we don't have too many channels as outputs, but if you were doing that, you would need to make sure that they're named. Um, and this becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, but for now, this, this will work because it is a relatively simple pipeline. Um, okay, so as alluded to earlier, um, we sort of touched on this a little bit in session two, and we talked about sub-workflows as well. Um, you can actually contain one entire workflow um, inside another. So here is an example of um, a workflow, which has been called my pipeline, and then that has been executed down here um, as part of a separate workflow uh, scope. So um, I'm just going to copy this um, and just sort of pop it back in here oh, and here and show you this again. Um, so this workflow has been written. Um, we have everything that we've shown previously. So the channel being created and the split letters and convert to upper. Um, this has still got the dot upper. So if you didn't do this as part of your module, you'll probably get an error. Um, what we can do is we can clear that and just run this again. So this entire pipeline is being executed here as a part of um, my pipeline is being included as a workflow inside um, the second workflow. Um, so you can see here that this is being run. And this is a way that if you were trying to include um, these modules more than once, you could um, sort of specify this uh, doing this. My pipeline two. And then we can do this and this. So um, now this is an example where you could have uh, multiple workflows, multiple uh, my pipelines included in the same in the same workflow or executed as part of the same workflow. So as you can see, everything has been uh, executed here twice, um, and I didn't have to set any aliases for my processes. Um, okay, so with workflow inputs, um, these can be um, defined using a take statement. Um, so for example, instead of using um, instead of using this as a part of the using the params dot greeting as a part of the channel dot of you can just say take it as a greeting um, and here so what I can do is just uh, what exactly have I copied okay the entire workflow uh, again this isn't um, massively different so I've still got this to um, this dot upper so your modules dot nf um, still has this submit Again, um, all that's really different here is I'm taking greetings. So you're taking um, greeting here, um, and this is being used um, in the pipeline. Ooh. So again, um, this is actually a little bit different here as well. So this is the named uh, pipeline. So we have the workflow pipeline, and we actually need to include um, the params dot greeting um, take is just a name. This is this is arbitrary as well. This doesn't have to be greeting. It could be um, greet or ing or or any other word that you want to put in there. I'm just going to save that and execute it again. So next flow run, um, hello world, and then this workflow which is named my pipeline is getting run here. The channel of params dot greeting, uh, which is up here. And that should execute successfully. Okay, um, much like. Um, take, you actually call your outputs something a little bit different in a workflow. So here you use emit. So take and emit, these are new words, um, as well as sort of main. So main being um, where we specify um, the actual code that you're executing. So take as much like and emit as like your outputs. Um, here we have the named output, um, convert dot out to upper. Um, so this is actually what it's going to emit as a part of this workflow. Um, so we can copy all of this across and replace it here. So this is what I am replacing, just the workflow my pipeline, um, because we now have this emit convert to upper. We see that the main has shrunk a little bit. So we no longer have this as a part of the main uh, sort of script block or main block um, as we've sort of come to know it. Um, has that copied in? Oh, it has two. So we don't need the second one. That one can go. So again, we can just run this, um, and this is just going to um, have this emitted uh, by the pipeline. So we can see that this is um, the one thing that's being emitted is the convert to upper, convert to upper dot out dot upper, um, and this is being um, specified here uh, by just using out um, because this isn't named. 
Yep, so that's just kind of explaining that um, in there as well. Um, so here's an example as well, how you can use um, just calling named workflows. We sort of touched on this a little bit as well. Um, so my pipeline one, my pipeline two, uh, this has been in, um, this has been done twice, uh, like was shown previously, but down here you can use the entry flag to say just start at my pipeline one. So this would be an example of where you don't want to potentially run, you know, pre-processing or something like that, or some sort of quality checks. You just want to sort of jump in halfway down the pipeline for, for some reason. Um, here we have a little bit more about parameter scopes. Uh, we've sort of done this in, in some detail already. Um, the main thing to remember is that you need this dollar sign to make it the um, the next flow, um, to make it identifiable by next flow as a next flow um, variable. Um, we sort of got this here as well, um, how you can specify, um, say hello, and then say hello is from modules. Um, and up here we've got the say hello, which is bringing in those parameters uh, already. Okay. Um, Here's just an example kind of expanding on this as well, how you can um, add parameters um, kind of used as defaults. So here, for example, um, if you were to run this, I'm just gonna put this in hello.nf. Um, you've got fill and bar. This is getting included from this modules um, here, which we haven't actually added. So I need to go back and do that. Um, here, um, so this has been um, included in the modules.nf and it's just been defined by saying hello um, rather than as a module. Um, so this is a little bit of a, um, an interesting example, but uh, what I wanted to show was that you can um, run this again, and this is being included from the modules um, file, and it's sort of picked up on these parameters, and in this case it's actually overridden the parameter um, because of this add params option, um, which is cool. Um, this is probably more advanced usage. Um, if you're kind of like a basic user just getting started, this is something you might consider um, down the line. but um, this is probably uh, slightly more advanced usage. Cool. And that's the end of it. So uh, like I said earlier, we do have the DSL2 migration notes here. Um, previously, uh, Nextflow migrated from DSL1 to DSL2, so um, the language changed a little bit. Um, generally, everything moving forward is DSL2, um, so you don't really need to worry about DSL1 anymore unless you're trying to execute um, or use a particularly old pipeline. Um, everything that we've done today has been focused on DSL2, um, so please don't worry about DSL1. Um, too much. With that, I think that is the end of today's session. Um, as a recap, we dug into um, managing dependencies and containers. We talked about channels, processes, and operators in more detail and gave you more examples. Uh, we had a brief introduction to Groovy um, because Nextflow is written um, on top of Groovy and it is a domain specific language. Um, and we finished off by talking about modularization and how uh, modules can be uh, written outside of your main script and imported using the import uh, include statements. Um, so that will finish it off today. Um, tomorrow we will talk about um, the configuration, deployment scenarios, um, and Nextflow Tower in greater detail. Great. Um, thanks very much, and we'll see you all again tomorrow.